to explain and relate things. That's what a theory is, is the abstractions we come up with to explain and relate things rather than a reflection of things. We don't let the things bounce off of us and come up with some idea. We actually try to explain those things. So as, as far as we come up with a road map, to that extent we have a theory of reality. I think, I don't know if he's read Aristotle, I think he might benefit by doing it because I don't think we have a major disagreement on what a theory is. He's saying a, a, a good theory would be a good road map that would get you around the city. And a bad theory would be a road map that didn't make any sense. Um, so the road map has to be an abstraction from the actual reality. Rather than saying it somehow reflects reality directly, like a mirror or something, or you know, a reflection is exactly what hits the sub, the, the whatever subject bounces off in exactly the same way, except in a you know mirror way or whatever. And rather than that, he says it's an abstraction from reality. That's what a theory is. And uh, like I say, you might benefit from a bit of reading of Aristotle there. Then he makes the point that on really big theories, really big ideas and stuff, it's difficult to, to tell when a, a theory is incoherent, when it doesn't correspond to reality. It's fine on a small theory, like uh, Mr. Cropper's going to come up with the example of, of uh, how do I get my lawn to grow? You can have theories about that, and incoherence in that would quickly show themselves. So you get your lawn to grow by putting jam on it? No. Um, so incoherence on that would show quickly, but incoherence in a vast massive theory like the system of the world is difficult to find. In the Middle Ages, he says they made this uh, fudge factor, they fudged things over by saying we don't understand that but God does. In science today they say we don't understand that but we will eventually. Okay, He's saying we might need to reject that a bit. If it doesn't cohere if it doesn't fit, if it contradicts the theory, if there's a situation or a problem, we might need to go back and look again. We, you know, might maybe it's no good to just go ahead and say, oh, don't worry, we'll get we'll get that later. We'll explain that later. Science will get well, science will explain that why that's happening. Wait, maybe we need to check our premises. Hmm? Let's concretize that. What's an example? Um, we know. Uh, how matter goes down a sinkhole, right? Like a like the tube in, in your tub when you empty your tub, <laughs> right? Uh, and then we know how galaxies rotate, and they rotate exactly different. You know, if gravity were the main force in a galaxy, you would see a certain type of rotation. But we see a rotation that's very bizarre, and that's why they propose dark matter. You may have heard of a ring of non-visible, non-detectable matter around the edge of galaxies comprising about 90% of the galaxy's mass, making it rotate at the speed it does. Well, you know, they, they say, we'll just exp we'll explain that someday. We'll get to the explanation of why they're rotating that way. Maybe we should step back and look at our premises, and the explanation might be staring us in the face, okay? So on large things like this, it's difficult to find incoherence, and sometimes things go get they don't get pointed out for a long time. Uh, whereas incoherence and theories of how to grow your grass would quickly become evident. Then he says that's the reason why it's so difficult to question an entire world view, because it is difficult to see incoherencies in it. And if everyone's accepted a world view, how do you point out incoherencies in it? It's very difficult to see them. And the interviewer says, and yet that's exactly what you're trying to do. He says, yes. And then the questioner makes the, the connection that the, the he, well, the questioner asserts that David Bohm is questioning the Western worldview, and the Eastern worldview is the opposite, he, the questioner assumes. And he says, well, yeah, I'm questioning the Western worldview, but the Eastern worldview, all these worldviews might have to come into question, he says. And he says at the end, what he's, he says, what I want is a dialogue between the worldviews. Oh, Lord. But uh, anyways, the point is, he says, the Eastern worldview isn't necessarily correct. We don't necessarily need to switch back to that. Some things in the Western worldview are correct. You see, because the Eastern worldview, what, is the, what does Buddhism say? It says everything is one, all is one. So this British interviewer, 
automatically assumes Buddhism. They know about the East. They've been telling them about that stuff. Uh, luckily, a lot of Americans have escaped it just to the brutal inefficiency of our education system. But anyways, he is questioning uh, our world view today, the, the dominant world view, not only of the West, but also of the East. I think that uh, he's trying to get us back on the footing of uh, like where Isaac Newton was. I believe that induction is possible and um, legitimate and beneficial. That's what I think. And he's, he's this naive interpreter, or pardon me, this naive interviewer wants to equate questioning the Western worldview with moving towards the Eastern worldview, becoming more holistic or whatever. You know, maybe there's a little more nuance to it than that. The Eastern worldview didn't necessarily have very many good answers, did it? That's why the West became ascendant. Then Bohm says, the way of the West is to look for truth in the parts. They are, they are in some sense fragmenting reality and looking for individual little truths and not looking for anything true for the whole. Like I said, they've left off induction. They don't care about induction so much anymore. Generalization, being able to say this holds true in the entire universe everywhere. Eh, we're not sure about that, but it definitely holds true with quarks inside of our laboratory on Tuesdays. Now he says when we break things up artificially, we are going to treat things as fragments when they are not fragments, when it's actually something that we need to relate to the, to the whole. It's not an individual thing without, in, you know, in a vacuum with no relation to anything. It is actually a phenomenon that's a result of reality. Okay, and he says we've got to remember that. And when we fragment things, we tend to unite the things inside of any given fragment. We say these things that have cropped up together in this fragment are it's somehow significant. They are united in some conceptual way. Whereas that's not necessarily true. After all, a fragment is only a fragment of the whole. We might need to look back to the whole to find out if these pieces of this fragment are actually a unity. It's all a bit of floating abstraction unless your mind's been a bit around in, uh, in quantum mechanics. Um, and he is arguing against this scattered worldview of quantum mechanics that we can never know anything and we have to focus in with a microscope on every single individual thing and we can never say anything about uh, anything in general. Perception creates reality, they say. It's the height of their absurdity. So to recap, we get confused about the part and the whole because we take a fragment as an independent whole, as a whole by itself. We want to look at the whole view of a fragment without regard for the whole whole. You know, he's, he's saying again, we need to forget that this is just a little teeny fragment. Forget that. Try to remember that it's part of everything else, too. Now the interviewer brings up a point that if you define the whole, then you're part of it. So can you ever really get a picture of the whole being part of it looking into the whole and here you are part of the whole? Now he says there's evidence for this that we are part of the whole, can't separate ourselves from it, in quantum mechanics. And he mentions the fact that the measurement has some participatory effect in the result of the experiment. Uh, just to support, it doesn't determine reality, it doesn't create reality, it doesn't determine reality, but it does have a participatory effect. When you make a measurement, the thing has been measured. If there's any effect on the thing, then that's true. Um, I can make a measurement of the moon's size, you know, at arm's length and call it two inches, that doesn't affect the moon. But if you try to measure electrons and see where they are, you have to fire photons or something at them and get some information about them and that changes things. So it's not our perception that changes it, it's our interaction with the item that, that changes it. But anyways, he says that's proof right there that you cannot just take the, the, um, the measuring instrument apart from this. You, know, you can't fragment them. They are not only together in the whole of reality, but they're also little parts of reality in themselves together in the whole of reality. Everything's interconnected. So, uh, it, so what about the possibility, what about the question of your truth and my truth and when you go to reality and you look at reality don't you change reality in a way and it changes you and isn't there an infinite feedback loop or something 
And here Bohm says that when you talk to somebody,